Thank you for coming around for this session. My name is Bulama Yusuf, and I work at Quantech Technology Services in Abuja, Nigeria. I'm here to talk about how we built an election monitoring app for the Nigeria elections. And that happened around this time last year. I am the team lead for mobile and web development at the company. So um, first of all, thank you for taking time out to come and listen to this session. But um, before I continue, I'd like to, to know how many of us here have, have built software using the waterfall model? Show of hands. OK. Um, how many of us don't use that anymore? You use something else, not waterfall. Or is it more in between? Little of this, little of that, you know, it's still OK. That's good. The one last question, how many of you have, have tried introducing a new software development methodology at their office? So maybe you try to say, let's now do Agile instead of, of Waterfall. How many? OK, cool. So I think um, we're together on this. So this talk is mainly going to be about technology and then people. Building software is complicated in itself. People are very hard to predict. And when you have people building software, you know, it creates a very chaotic scenario, if not well managed. So um, I'll talk to you about the work context in which the company I work at operates back in Nigeria. We'll talk a little about how we do our own software development, so our own version of Waterfall. I'll talk about how we saw an opportunity to go agile, and how I was able to convince our management to let us experiment with this software development methodology. And then what did it take for us to actually go agile? And then we'll look at the technology stack we used in building this app. And of course, we'll talk about the lessons we learned while doing that. So like I mentioned, Quantec Technology Services operates in Abuja. Abuja is the capital of Nigeria. It's located in West Africa. It's an IT consulting firm, and we offer IT advisory, systems integration, training, and project management to our clients. And our clients are mainly government organizations in the public sector. You know, so they come to us when they need custom software built, or they need to get a consultant to manage a particular IT project, or they need some kind of training. You know, so those are the kind of services we offer. Um, the company has around 80 members of staff. So it's not a small company. You know, so we have like 80 members of staff. And they are broadly categorized into four different groups or units within the company. And the group I belong to is called Research and Systems Development Group. So anytime there's a need for the company to do some kind of systems integration or custom software development, that kind of comes to my unit. And we're around 17 members of that team. And we have software architects, business analysts, database developers and administrators. We have front-end developers, technical writers. You know, That makes up the team. So like I mentioned, we've always used the waterfall approach. Um, I'm not saying it's, it's a bad way of building software. By I'm saying it, it, it kind of makes things you know, a bit more complicated, especially when it comes to handling change. The methodology is not designed to respond rapidly to change. You know, not that it doesn't respond to change, but it doesn't respond fast enough to deliver business value to 
the client. You know, so there are two things to this. There's the methodology itself, and then there's the architecture of the system for which you are building. So you have an architecture that is not designed for change, and you're using a software development process that doesn't rapidly change, you know, you can see how hard it would be for any change to take place. And if you build anything for a client, more often than not, they ask you to change something. You know, because from the time you speak with the client and the time you say, okay, this is your software, you know, it takes more than two to three months. And by that time, something would have changed. And most clients, when they see what you've built for them, they get more ideas and they tell you, oh, but maybe we should have done this that way, we should have done this this way. And then it just creates a whole lot of painful experiences for us. Pain in the sense that it makes relationships between the company and the client strained. You know, we we'd almost end up seeing the client as the problem because we take all this time and effort to build this piece of software, we bring it to you, and then you now ask for change. And then we don't do that immediately. We don't deliver business value on time. The client becomes unhappy. Now, even within the team, internally, it causes a whole lot of pain and stress. There are situations whereby a client asks for a change, um, it gets to the team members, and then everybody is just unhappy because it's going to take a whole lot of effort to make sure that that business value is delivered to the client. And then at the same time, because of the process, the software development methodology, it's hard to, to go back. You know, if someone that's working on the front end of the application says, I don't think this part works quite right. Let me talk to the database guys so that they can make this change. You meet database guys and say, no, we can't make the change because the ERD says we should do it this way, this way, this way, and, and that's it. You know, so before you know, you're going all the way back to the business analyst who tells you, well, these are the requirements, and what you're asking for doesn't seem to fit into any of these requirements. How do I map it? You know, so I hope you get the idea of how hard it is for, for things to change. Now, this is just the reduced or shortened version of you know, the process, people involved, and what the output is. So like I said, business analyst talks to the client, comes up with some requirements, the architect does some designs, you know, um, the ERD, data flow, and so on. Part of it gets to the database developers who now implement that functionality, come up with the database, have their scripts, um, and then we use, mostly we use MySQL in implementing our relational databases, and we work with stored procedures. Um, how many of us here have, have used stored procedures? Okay, cool. So that's mainly the way the front end communicates with the, with the back end. So the front end guys build the user facing part of the application, and then at some point, it gets tested, the documentation is written, and the software is deployed for the client. And as you can see, the client doesn't appear to be so happy. Then the next thing that happens is the client says, oh, could we make this change? And then that sets off a whole lot of, of issues, because you now need to go back and start making changes. And it's costly. Um, and in most cases, because of the architectural design, it's, it's very hard to make changes. You know? So all this kind of gives you the context in which we've been handling projects before, before now. Um, there's this particular client we had recently, I think like two years ago, that did us to build a system for. So um, one of the things we decided to do was, OK, let's break the application into components. You know, and this shows some of the components we decided to come up with in building that application. So the idea is we have the client connects to the business logic, you know, it does, and the business logic fetches data from the database. And mind you, this, this is some, it's tightly coupled. You know, so if you change one component here, you know, it affects the component that depends on it. 
it would have been good if this is what we actually built for that particular client. But in reality, this is what really happened. We ended up having the business logic in the database itself. And that's been you know, encapsulated in the stored procedures. It would have been still OK if this was really what it was. But it wasn't. There was really no part of the database you go and take and say, OK, this is the part that has to do with user management. I'd like to take it out and move it to some other database system. Or this has to do with assessment, a particular feature the client required. I'll take this out and take it to some other database. Or if there are any changes on assessment, this is the only place I need to implement those changes. It wasn't so. What, what really happened was user management was in every part of the database. So if you wanted to do reporting, for example, before the reports could be pulled up, pulled up that the data for the reports, some kind of user authentication, authorization will be done by that same procedure before it fetches the data and returns it to the client. Same thing with what the client says assessment. You need to assess some kind of entities in, in the database. So if they need to change the rules for assessment, you know, it affects almost everything in the database. So there was really no part you could see, this is user management, these are the boundaries, assessments, or reporting. So with that, you can see how making change becomes a, a very you know, hard thing, and we resist the change. So that happened project in, project out. But it didn't feel right to me. You know, because that's not how software development should be done. At least I didn't see it that way. Um, there were other companies that just kept on churning out one application after the other, successful applications. And they were handling change pretty well. So I was wondering, how were they able to do this? How were they able to achieve this? Now, just before then, I'd been researching on agile methodologies. But I never really quite understood it, you know, until I got to the point whereby I really had to go back and study it again. You know, my understanding was, if you're doing agile, then you're just creating a very chaotic way of building software. You don't document, you know, you don't test, you just build software, and if it doesn't work, you come back and you build it again. But on careful examination, I found out that that wasn't really the case. You know? So <clears throat> this is how I felt about the team I was part of. In December 2014, um, high-level management at the office asked that, why don't we build an app for the upcoming 2015 elections. And the election was supposed to be in the first quarter of 2015. And we said, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. We tried building an app for the previous elections in 20, 2011, but that never came through. So we said, yeah, now would be a good time to start working on that. And for me, that got me really interested because I saw this as an opportunity to experiment with an agile way of building applications. So we got polling unit data. That's data specifying where all the polling units in the country are. And we had more than 115,000 polling units. The map here shows you know, the location of each of those polling units. Um, Nigeria is broken into six geopolitical zones. And there are 36 states. And at the time, the estimate was there were 177 million Nigerians. So our target for this app we wanted to build, we wanted to make it a mobile app. Because this explosion of internet users in the country, a lot of smartphones being used. So we said, OK, we might be able to ride on that wave and build a mobile app where we'd have voters 
you know, report what happens at their own polling unit. We aggregate that data and see what it tells us, share it with others. You know, we thought that was something that people would be interested in and it's worth doing. So as you can see from the diagram there, we're targeting registered voters that had access to the internet and also used smartphones. But that was just the beginning of our challenges. We had no experience building software for the general public. You know, we always had this client that we could always go to and say, okay, what is it you want? How do we get the data we need from you before we start building the app? We had never really built a mobile app as a team before then. We had some people, part of the team, that had experimented here and there, but as a team, we had never officially done any mobile app. Then another question was, how do we tell what the requirements for the app would be? Again, it's because we've always had a client to go to, interview, and elicit the requirements from. And this time around, we're dealing with the general public. So how are we going to go about that? And even if we got the requirements and we build the app, how do we tell if people love the app? How do we tell if they don't like it? How do we get feedback? You know, so these were some of the questions we had to answer even before starting. And then how do we scale? How do we handle the potential traffic we could get from our target users? But the greatest challenge was convincing management to let us do Agile. So there are, there are two layers of, of management from my own unit. So I have a manager, and my manager has his own manager. Now the idea to build the app came from the top manager. You know, so he told my manager, my manager told us that, okay, this is something we need to do. And I was like, oh, great. I think it's an opportunity for us to try this new way of building software that I've come across. I mean, relatively new to us, though Agile has been around for quite a while. But I was quick to realize that management was a bit reluctant to let us try that. For reasons I didn't know of then, but I know of now. And they mainly have to do with, with culture. You know, changing your software development methodology has to do with changing your corporate culture. And changing culture is a very hard thing to do because a lot of things need to change internally. A lot of things have to be, you know, you have to let go of a whole lot of things. Um, if you're doing, if you're using a waterfall approach to building software, I don't know how it is at your end, but it's more of a command and control kind of approach. Work or tasks get pushed to you. The time you take to implement your own part is predefined way before you start working on it. The architecture is, is done and just given to you and you don't question it. You know, you have boxes here and there and that's what you're expected to do and you just go ahead and you do it. And now I was saying, okay, let's try something else, which went totally opposite to what we were used to, you know. I just suggest that you don't push tasks to people. You know, instead, they pull it off the backlog. Um, you know, so that, as I then, I didn't really understand that that was the issue. But looking at it now, I know that it was a cultural thing. So it was quite hard to get management to buy into this. And I and my team members didn't really want to go the waterfall route anymore. So what I did was, I told my manager, do you know what, I'll take responsibility for this project. Just hand over everything to me and 
I'll talk to top management, and they will talk to me if they need any information or updates on this project. So I'll handle the pressure directly. And since it wasn't coming from a client that was paying for the project, you know, it was seen as a low-risk project. So nothing to lose, right? I said, okay, go ahead and do what you want to do. <clears throat> Sorry. So I, that was how I got management to side with us on this. And it's very important to get their backing. Now, they say you should be careful for you know, what you wish for, because you, you might just get it. That's what happened. You know, we're fighting for this, and then we eventually got it. And then when we now had to go ahead to go and build this application using this new approach, relatively new to us, you know, I was asking myself, now what? It's easy to sit down and read you know, about Scrum, about the um, Scrum rituals, how you build and organize your team, what are the tools you need. But to actually do it is a bit more challenging for several reasons. One of them being that the team I worked with had been doing Waterfall for as long as they knew software development. You know, so they only knew one way of building software. And then, as humans, it's also hard for you to just switch from doing one thing to another, especially when you had no idea about what it is that you're going into. So I had to manage all these, all these issues. Um, another thing is, if you're doing Agile, it encourages you to have a cross-functional team. Using traditional ways of building software encourages teams to be built around technology. You know, so you have your database team, you have your front-end team, you have a bunch of testers here, and they don't quite you know, share much information between themselves. If something goes wrong with the test, it comes back all the way up. So it comes back to the front end guys, we need to go back to the database guys before something gets fixed. And in between, there is a lot of blaming and finger pointing, which, to be honest, kills team morale. Um, so we had to build a cross-functional team. The team had to understand that we're going to be a cross-functional team, and this is how it's going to be different from how we've been doing things before. If we had to go and do a complete data model, implement it before passing it over to the front-end guys or the middle-tier guys, this time around it's going to be slightly different. We don't need to build the whole thing. We're going to do it in, in slices, in vertical slices, you know, which means we had less things to work on, and we all shared a common understanding. Now, with the architecture, instead of just drawing diagrams and taking some major decisions and just passing it over to the team, you know, we did it a bit differently. Yes, that was done. Some diagrams were, were drawn, some decisions were taken, but the team members were also involved. You know, we said, okay, we're going to go with MySQL, but we're not going to run them on our local servers. It's going to be cloud-based. And these are the reasons. And on top of that, we're going to have an API, a REST API, and these are the reasons. And for the client, we're going to have an Android client, an iOS client, Windows Mobile, and so on. So the team members were, were brought in at a very early stage. This was explained to them, and we made sure that everybody understood what every little box in the architectural diagram meant. And we also got their own inputs on what they think you know, we should change or what they agree with. And we didn't practice all the Scrum rituals. Um, mainly because we only knew a few of them, and it wasn't as if we were following a particular way of doing it. But there was a need for us to meet every morning, and for everyone to say what they had done the day before, 
issues they had faced and what they planned to do in the coming hours. This was drastically different from how we do things. But surprisingly, the team members found it very you know, useful as a way of keeping them on their toes and ensuring that everybody had every other person's back. You know, the key focus was talking about issues. There was a lot of talk. I discussed with a lot of them, trying to encourage them to bring out any issues they might be having early on. Don't wait until when you're done or finished before you bring it up. If you have any issue, let us know. If we need to make any change or if we need to rally around and try and fix that issue, it's better we do it then than later because we've had a whole lot of bad experiences where people find out that something is wrong but no one else knows, so just within the team, and they tell themselves, okay, do you know what? We'll fix this later. We have just two days to finish building this, and this is what the diagram says. So let's just do it this way. Um, once, once it's out, we'll fix it much later. And we accumulated a whole lot of technical debt. So stand-ups were a very good way for us to thrash out these things early on. And then we also did sprint reviews, where everyone came and we got together and we demoed what we had built, that functionality we had built. That was something new, and the team members found very interesting as well. I think the only new tool we used was a sprint board, which was a part of the wall in the office, where we had sticky notes of the tasks we had broken down you know, up there to do in progress, in tests, and done. Um, and we had other members of the team coming around to look at the board and say, oh, what's this? What's going on here? But it was pretty interesting because we now had a physical way of seeing the state of our work. You know, so when we started, we had a whole lot of things on the left, and over time, they all moved over to the right. And for me personally, it was... Um, it gave me a whole lot of satisfaction to see items moving from one point to the other physically and not just in your head. You know, and the same thing applied to your team members too. So that was a very useful tool we had there. Then talking about culture. When we do waterfall, you don't dare finish your own part without doing some form of documentation. And once those documents are written, they hardly get revisited and updated. So what usually happens is at the end of a particular project, you have the documentation and then you have the working software. But usually the documentation is way out of tune with what is working because no one went back to update those documents. So when we started, we said, okay, do you know what? We're not going to focus too much on writing documents. But if you need to communicate something to someone else, or if there's anything that someone needs to know when you're not there, put it down. Even if it's just a notepad. Just type it out. It doesn't have to be a beautiful document. Just type it out. We'll flesh it out later. So we had a central repository where all those kind of documents were kept. We have little, little snippets here and there. And surprisingly, as work progressed, I noticed team members were always going back to their documents and updating them because I told them that you should think about it this way. If, unfortunately, you get hit by a bus, a lot of things in your head go with you and your team members won't be able to continue work, which has always been the notion, even with our traditional way of building software. But I think this time around, the fact that they were brought in early on they were more committed to the project you know, and saw reason as to why they not being there or the team not having information they need would be a problem. So documentation was done, but it was done a bit differently. Also, the team took more control of the work they did and they reported more often. You know, they were not forced to report. So they reported on their work more often. And then when someone says it's going to take me two days to build this component or three days to implement this feature, you know, it was really a good estimate as opposed to when you're told, okay, you need to build um, this code to fetch data from the database 
and display some kind of report. I need to do that in four hours. When you're done with that, you're going to work on some other thing. You know, so you had people working on a task that's meant to last four hours, but instead it take like four days doing it. You know, and that directly affects reporting. So that's how we the kind of changes the team faced when we actually went agile. Now this here shows a little about how we stacked the technology we, we used. Um, we went with MySQL mainly because the database developers were skilled in using MySQL. Could have used any other one, but we had more skill in doing that. And we hosted our instances on Google Cloud SQL. On top of that, we had a REST API, which talked to MySQL and exposed REST services to the clients. Um, and in order to make sure that we, we scaled well and we didn't have a lot of latency in, from the clients, we, we used Memcache on Google App Engine. And of course, App Engine automatically scales, so we enjoyed that as well. So we built two mobile applications, one being Android and another iOS. Um, at the time, we didn't have someone skilled in building iOS applications, so we had to give that to someone outside the company to build, which also made us to do more documentation because we had to communicate to that person how exactly we wanted the app to be built. So because we were building a mobile app for the first time and that we adopted going agile, it made it a bit easier for us to handle. For example, one of the features we had was a feature that enabled a user, when you start the app, it takes your location and then it tells you all the polling units that are within a two kilometer radius of where you are. Now, how do you go about building such a thing? So we just told database person, okay, do you know what? We just want to be able to store this polling unit data and be able to fetch it when we give you certain coordinates. That's all we need from database at this point. For the REST API, we just need to connect to the database and then expose that data to the client. And the API also had to accept the location of the client and some other identification um, data from the device. And on the mobile app, all we had to do was to build like a, a splash screen and then a screen to display the polling units that are returned. So you can see it made the task a bit more easier to handle. And that's how we build the whole application in slices. You know, so it gave the team um, more room to focus on doing little bits of the application. And we kept on doing it that way. And that's one of the benefits of, of going with Agile. Otherwise, we would have ended up doing the whole back end then we'll now come and do the whole REST API, and then the mobile apps get built. And more often than not, when that is being done, you find out that, oh, we forgot to implement some particular feature. Or when someone forgets his password, how do you get it back? That feature doesn't seem to work. I now tell the REST team, and that goes back all the way up. You know, but we didn't do it that way. Instead, we built it you know, in slices which was a very nice experience. And it helped the team to take it you know, one step at a time. And what we did was, whenever we finished building one slice, we tested it and then deployed it on Google Play. For the iOS, it took a different life cycle, but for Android, each time we finished a sprint and we did a demo, would um, package it and deploy it on Google Play and then ask the other team members to download it 
and try it out, and other members of, of the company. You know, so when we got feedback from team members, I could see that the, the morale of the people that are working on this team improved a lot. Yeah, so I don't know if you agree with me that one of the greatest joys of building software is seeing people use your software. Is, is that true? So that really got the team going. They build, they build something, they test it, they deploy it, you know, and they come in the next day and they have some other member of the team telling them, oh, I tried this and it's really cool, but can you guys now add this? Can you guys now do that? So right from the start, I told them that whenever we get feedback like this, bring it to the other members of the team. We sit down and decide on how to integrate the feedback. And we also put in you know, feedback forms on the app as well, right from the very start. So people could send feedback to us. And I also found that quite you know, helpful. And here are some screenshots of the application. So at the top left there, you can see that's the welcome screen. And following that is a screen that shows you a list of the polling units around you and also gives you the distance from where you are to the polling unit and a brief description of that polling unit and the code for the polling unit, the ID. Then the next screen, the third one there, shows the aggregated reports that users sent in. Because we had a feature that let voters on the day of election to tell us certain things about the election. Um, was there any violence? Uh, was there a lot of voters around? Did the officials come out late? And at the end of the election, when the votes were counted, who, who won in your own area? So we took that from different points, all the polling units that reported, and then we aggregated it based on state and geopolitical zones that I mentioned earlier. So as a user, you could see a report like this showing up on your, on your mobile device. Um, so you have the polling unit details showing you its location, and then the, the other screen there that has what's happening at this unit is what users see when they want to report what's going on at their own particular polling unit. And they also collected data on, on gender as well. And then the last screen on the top right there is showing your current location and then your polling units around you. So typically this amounted to you know, one, one feature at a time. In general, that's how we, we implemented it. And I don't know if you agree with me, but the user interface looks quite good for doing it for the first time. You know, so a whole lot of work went into it. No, it's GPS data, yeah, yeah. Okay. Automatically acquired. Yeah. So in general, we had fun building this this app. But we also learned a lot of lessons. The first one there is cross-functional teams resolve problems faster. That's obvious, right? Um, when, you, when you have a bunch of people handling specific technology like the database, and then you need to make a change, and unfortunately, those people are not there to make that change, then nothing gets done. You have to wait for those guys to come back to make that change either because you're not allowed to directly make the change, or even if you are given the code base, it will take you a long time to figure out what's really going on and actually implement that change. But with a cross-functional team, the idea is 
you have someone that is responsible for a particular part of the code, and someone else knows about what's going on. So there's never really a time, unless in extreme cases, where nothing can be done because one person isn't there. And since change happens all the time, you'd always have someone that knows a little or knows enough to enforce or make a change in any area of the code. So going agile is, is easy, but changing corporate culture isn't, for obvious reasons. You know, you can't be doing something for 15, 20 years, and then all of a sudden you just want to switch like that. You know, you're not a, a robot where you just upload the new data into your, your, your brain and then start making the change. No, it doesn't work like that. So, if you are thinking of changing your software development methodology, you know, it's really, that's not really what you're doing. You're actually trying to change culture. And accept it or not, people identify with culture. In some cases, it really defines people. You know, so people find it very hard to say, okay, we're going to stop doing things this way and start doing it the other way, especially if it is a bottom-up kind of change they're trying to, to bring about. So that makes it quite, quite hard. And then even if people agree, or a team member say, okay, let's do it, it's really hard for you to adopt this new way of doing things. You know, you're used to being told what to do, and then all of a sudden it switches. You know, so it makes it quite you know, uneasy. The third point there is team morale improves. I noticed that firsthand with my team members. And I also believe so does their health. Their health also improves. I've seen situations whereby someone comes to the office in the morning and the first thing they're told is, oh, project X, Y has crashed. You need to go and make a change. And then you've seen this person that was just smiling early in the morning, saying hi, having a very sad face. You know, because they know the amount of technical depth they have taken. They probably have an idea why that application crashed. And all those things they avoided doing in the first place has now come back to haunt them. And then in most cases, everyone points a finger at you. Say, oh, you made this crash. It's your fault. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. But in the real sense, sometimes it's not really the person's fault. It was you know, pushed all the way down. So people get stressed out, especially when change is mentioned. You see situations whereby the business analyst just walks past, is on the phone, and you hear him talking to a particular client, and then all of a sudden, you're not happy about it. Because if that call was about a change that the client needs, you know that, oh, you have to go back to that big ball of messy code you've been avoiding. You know, so in some cases, you find people get really, really stressed out. One of the practical reasons is when you're working on such code bases, you have a lot of things you need to put in your head and keep in context while you're working on it. You know, because there's a whole lot of mess. But when we decide to go with Agile, we noticed that team morale improved. We had a shorter cycle. Like I said, you know, as developers, you're always happy when you see people using your software. You know, so within a short period of time, project has started just in two weeks, you're seeing something you've built and people are using and giving you feedback. And that got people really motivated. And that made them even put in more into the project. So they had less to bother about. We knew we were building a very big you know, application, at least at that moment. But it didn't feel that way, because all you had to focus on was just this little slice of the application. Last point there is collaboration is encouraged, and therefore team members become more committed. 
you know, why would you want to destroy something you help build, something you are involved in right from the very start? You know, so that will achieve with that shared understanding and shared architecture. When you involve people, get their opinions right from the very start and actually work on their opinion if they make very good suggestions, you find out that the, a part of them, that project becomes a part of them and they put in more into it. You know, and that makes them, they become more committed. Unlike when they're just trying to finish this piece of code, package it, and then throw it over to the client as if it was some grenade, which always explodes. But this time around, people took time, made sure that what they're doing works, tested it, and they were open to suggestion because they know that someone is using it. And if you make those changes, you know, you make someone happy at the other end. So, we basically walked through, through this, gave you a context of the work environment, our thought development methodology, um, how we identified an opportunity, convinced management, and how we actually went agile. And we saw a little about the technology stack and the lessons learned. So are there any questions? OK. Um, so given that your project was internally sponsored, yeah. Okay, I was hoping I won't get a question on that. <laughs> okay, so that's, that was a very challenging area as well because we didn't have experience, you know, dealing with the general public. And we spent a whole lot of time, as usual, bending down and writing code until someone figured out that, but how are you going to deploy this? How are you going to get people to use this app? So what we did was, and it was quite late, what we did was we, we did a Facebook ad and kept it running for a couple of, of weeks. We got people in the company to engage people on social media and try and push that as far as possible, get their own friends to do that, and so on. And we even went as far as going to the government agency in charge of elections called Independent National Elections Commission to try and speak to some officials over there. So we got some, um, a forum to speak with them and see how they could help us publicize this. And you're asking about the number of people that actually used it. So it wasn't really high. We had a very little number that used it. But all the same, we were really happy and excited about it. So we had a little over a thousand installs. And luckily those that installed it did use the app. So we got reports coming in, we got images sent in, and we had a lot of people, you know, installing the app and getting data from from the reports we had. So that's that's another lesson we learned that from the onset, if you're building something like this, you need to consider publicity. We even had um, an arrangement to go and talk on radio, but that, that didn't go through. So yeah, that's, that's how that happened. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so you're asking if we'll be able to implement these changes like um, the agile approach on our other ways of doing business, right? Yes, um, so when this happened, it was successful. Top management was happy about it, you know. We delivered on time and as promised. 
So the, the next step was to see how we could apply that to the whole unit. So that it becomes the major way of, of building, uh, put to building software. So, but to that, it's been a year now, but I can't say that we are fully transitioned. It's still somewhere in between, you know, but we're still in the process of trying to achieve that. Yeah. Any other question? Yes, that's, in fact, that's the main reason why. And there's a, there's a back story to that, I can tell you after the presentation, but that's one of the main, main reasons why, yeah. Okay, so thank you once more for, for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to this session. Um, have a great evening. Thank you. Yeah.